My name is Andre Gonoella. Welcome to the Burn Bag Podcast. Uh, we are coming on the air at about 12.40 p.m. Eastern Time uh, following the breaking news that the de facto leader of Hamas, uh, Sinwar, has been killed by the Israeli uh, Defense Forces. Uh, Sinwar was the leader of Hamas in Gaza, but following death of some of the other leaders, he has basically been the de facto leader of Hamas. Uh, to dissect this, I have brought on my old friend and mentor, Javed Ali. Javed is is the former Senior Director of Counterterrorism on the National Security Council. He is a longtime counterterrorism uh, official and currently teaches at the University of Michigan. So, Javed, thanks for joining me here today. Andre, always great to be with you. And I think it's been a couple years since I've been on the podcast, but uh, always, always uh, happy to, to share perspectives with you and your audience. Sure, definitely. So, Javed, uh, what are your reactions, first of all, to the death of Sinwar? So, first reaction was not a surprise that uh, Israel was targeting him. He was, and I said this in the dozens, if not hundreds of interviews I've given over the past year, just uh, in the aftermath of October 7th, I, and I've said that funding Yaya Sinwar and killing and capturing him was probably the top priority um, for the Israeli campaign, or at least one of the, the top priorities in addition to rescuing the, the hostages. And if you think about sort of a parallel to what appears to have happened with Sinwar's death is that you, if your uh, listeners remember, some may, um, some may not, but how the U.S. felt going back now uh, 13 years in the aftermath of the very bold uh, military uh, raid that President Obama authorized against Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad, Pakistan, that also brought an end to the face of al-Qaeda and the person who was um, responsible for the 9-11 attacks on the United States and the person who most Americans probably conceptualize as the face of international terrorism, that's the, Yahya Sinwar is that same person to the Israelis. So both from an sort of operational perspective, it is a major development that I, I think for Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet, it's even probably a bigger political victory, much the same way the death of bin Laden was in the United States going back to 2011. No, I mean, certainly it is a political victory, especially for Netanyahu. Uh, but I mean, does it change anything significantly in Hamas? This may be a dumb question, but I mean, did the death of bin Laden really change how al-Qaeda operated, right? Like, I mean, is Sinwar more of a symbol or was he more of a practical managerial leader? Well, Sinwar was both, um, perhaps in a way that bin Laden wasn't but but even with that said and as, as you mentioned at the top of, of of the introduction you know someone like myself who's studied terrorism and counterterrorism and then was in it um for a long stretch of my government career now out on the academic side one of the features of that from a counterterrorism perspective uh or that long arc uh in my own life is looking at leadership removal from in in terrorist organizations of all different sort of stripes and categories and different parts of the world. And in moments, what is that leadership removal, whether they're killed or captured or, or literally just kind of walk away from, um, those positions, although that, that last thing tends to really happen. What does that mean to the groups overall? And there's really no singular answer on that, but, but a common theme is that most of the time, even with the death of a senior leader, as someone as symbolic as a bin Laden, as a Yahya Sinwar, as a Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the former head of um, ISIS uh, in 2019, it almost never leads to the strategic collapse of the group themselves. Now, it has a profound effect, and sometimes the next person who comes after the symbolic person who is removed isn't as capable, doesn't have the same ability to guide and lead the organization. Um, but I don't think, at least in the near term, that this means the end of Hamas as an organization, even though they've been under tremendous pressure by Israel the past year. I have to assume that the Hamas executive committee will, um, pretty, once, once it's confirmed that Sinwar is dead, that will announce not only his replacement as the political chief, and Sinwar was wearing two hats. He was the political chief of 
Hamas, but he's also the head of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and then they will also probably appoint a different person to be the head of Hamas in Gaza. And that person, like Sinwar, has to be on the ground with what remains of Hamas in Gaza versus the more political Hamas officials who are in Cairo and in uh, Doha, Qatar. So this is just complete speculation on my part, but I'm making the assumption that there will be two new people in the two different jobs that Sinwar both held singularly for a few months uh, until what appears to be his, his death today. Yeah, and I mean, sort of, I mean, this comes very shortly after the death of Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the leader of Hezbollah, and essentially the wiping out of that entire command structure, virtually, of Hezbollah. I mean, Javed, sort of when you look at the the elimination, essentially, of the leadership of Hezbollah, it's been a couple of weeks now. Have you sort of observed, you know, from your experience that the organization of Hezbollah has been like severely weakened. And do you sort of anticipate something similar happening to Hamas now? Or, you know, sometimes maybe you wipe out the leaders, uh, it becomes a bit more difficult uh, following, you know, those eliminations. Well, Hamas is in worse shape than Hezbollah. And Hamas has had a lot of its senior leadership um, decimated uh, over the past year. They have lost more fighters and equipment and infrastructure and weapons um, than even Hezbollah has. And they were relatively less capable than Hezbollah, too. So I think Hamas was already in a, a weaker state. This will you know, make things more difficult for them. And again, I think they're going to replace uh, someone with two people. But it, it won't mean the end of Hamas. And they're, they will still continue to fight uh, and, unless um, the new political chief of Hamas sort of agrees to a ceasefire. There's still hostages that have not been rescued or recovered. And and Hamas still, even in this very weakened state, still presents a threat to Israel. And I think one of the questions is how far is Netanyahu willing to go to really grind down Hamas as an organization? Now, flipping to the Hezbollah um, uh sort of parallel, even as you mentioned, you know, it's pretty striking that in a, about a month, Israel has eliminated a significant um, portion of Hezbollah's senior leadership, including Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General, and he had that job since 1992. A lot of the old guard of Hezbollah who were around in or with the organization when it was created in 1982, they, those, those men are now dead. Um, uh, there's still some left, but again, you know, significant component is, is now dead. But Hezbollah has a much deeper pool of fighters and has possesses far more operational capability than Hamas did, whether it's in terms of a direct threat to Israel still, or this is what Hamas didn't have, a global terrorist attack capability that can, with very little sort of warning, strike Israeli or Jewish, Jewish interests worldwide. And, and that's what Hezbollah did in the 1980s and 1990s. I'm actually surprised Hezbollah has not been able to pull something like that off over the past month. And again, maybe we just overestimated their capability, but at least that's something they have in their hip pocket that, that Hamas didn't have. Uh, so I still think you're going to see the IDF continue to prosecute, prosecute the campaigns both against Hezbollah and both against Hamas, despite the leadership uh, removals that have happened. Because I, looking at it from the Israeli side or trying to get inside the minds of, uh, mind of Prime Minister Netanyahu, they have all the momentum right now. And there's not a lot of pressure that's being applied against Israel to stop outside of the, you know, the letter that um, came uh, through yesterday or last couple of days. Um, from the United States. But um, you know, there's only three weeks left to go with the US election. I don't think President Biden wants to get too further involved in, in trying to kind of manage manage this from the, the US perspective. So from Netanyahu's perspective, he's got the operational momentum with his military and probably he's reading the political tea leaves here. No, yeah, ab absolutely. I'd say there are a lot of political tea leaves uh, at play. But I mean, you know, when we talk about sort of the militants in Gaza right now, you know, you have Hamas, 
but you also have groups like the Palestinian uh, Islamic Jihad. Uh, and I'm sort of curious about, you know, to what extent our leaders like Sinwar, our leaders of Hamas as more of the central organization, able to control and influence, you know, these other sort of splinter militant groups? And uh, would maybe a successive leader have more difficulty, perhaps? Could there be more... Uh, you know, how do you call it, more splintering, more breakups among uh, those militant groups. So Palestinian Islamic Jihad is a completely separate organization from Hamas with a different leadership structure and command structure and, and smaller than Hamas as well. And even though over the past year, Israel has conducted some operations against uh, uh, that group, for the most part, their campaign in Gaza has been against Uh, Hamas, not uh, Islamic Jihad. But depending on on what who the replacements uh, are or replacement uh, is for Sinwar, I think the group will, at least in the near term, still be fairly cohesive. I it will be interesting to see if there are splinter factions that that emerge. But um, but there there are still these. No, there's a there's a structure to Hamas at the political level that exists in Cairo and in uh, Doha, Qatar. They don't control sort of the fighting elements on the ground um, in Gaza, but that's where these decisions are going to be made with those Hamas officials. Um, and so I think they are going to do everything they can to try and keep the organization intact, even though it has been significantly degraded over the past year by Israel. No, definitely. And I mean, you know, now that Sinwar is dead, a lot of the leaders are dead. A lot of the former senior leaders are now dead and, you know, we'll likely see the successive leaders uh, come into play. I mean, like what is left? I mean, like looking back at prior conflicts where we've dealt with uh, the elimination of leaders like this, I mean, like what is left? I mean, I still feel like this campaign is going to persist. It's going to still, you know, go through. I mean, Are we closer to the end or are we closer to the beginning of this war in general? Well, I mean, these are all questions that are almost impossible to answer from where I sit here in Ann Arbor. I mean, you have to be on the ground uh, in the rooms with Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in his war cabinet or on the flip side, you know, where these Hamas conversations are are taking place. But, um, you know, these large terrorist groups, there's another one of these sort of patterns that emerges if you sort of look at this, the history of terrorism and counterterrorism, you know, Most large terrorist groups um, that can stay around for decades um, are pretty resilient, even in the aftermath of significant leadership losses and even you know personnel losses um, underneath them. And going to the U.S. Um, perspectives on first the campaign against Al Qaeda, which is a much smaller group than Hezbollah or Hamas ever was, you know, by orders of several orders of magnitude, and then Um, ISIS, which was basically the same kind of strength of, of, of Hamas um, or Hezbollah, um, those groups are both still around, despite the, um, the 20, well, at least for Al-Qaeda, a 20-year-plus campaign of, led by the United States against Al-Qaeda and killing Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri and all of the operational chiefs and lots of other key figures associated with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda has not been defeated, and at least in the sense that they have not surrendered, right? They're, they have not said, we are no longer in the business of conducting terrorist attacks against the West or the United States or U.S. interests overseas, and the same thing has happened to ISIS. Um, now, again, they were battered tremendously by the U.S.-led campaign, and they're working with a collection of partners in Iraq and Syria and the international coalition, but ISIS, the, the what ISIS was in Iraq and Syria, that has definitely been degraded, but there are still ISIS franchises around the world that are very active and very violent. And the one that's emerged over the past couple of years is the ISIS franchise in Afghanistan known as ISIS Khorasan. And that's the group that has pulled off two major terrorist attacks this year in Iran and then Moscow. There's a lot, been lots of media reporting the last um, few months about ISIS Khorasan linked individuals who were able to travel into the United States undetected. Uh, and those links only emerged after they 
managed to get in. Now, luckily, no terrorist plotting um, uh, associated with that. Uh, and hopefully, there they, they won't be. But ISIS is still around as well. And I think that's what's going to be the future of both Hamas and Hezbollah. I don't see, even with new leadership, whoever those people are, uh, I don't see either of them sort of changing their orientation. I could be totally wrong on that, but again, looking at sort of the the pattern of this with a, with a much longer historical lens like I have, I think we're, we're still gonna be dealing with Hamas and Hezbollah as some element of them for years and decades to come. You know, and you know, when I hear about you know this news of Sinwar's death or of the deaths of other sort of terror leaders, other militant leaders, and so on, I, I get a little angsty sometimes because I'm sort of concerned sometimes about the public safety threats that may occur. You know, with you know lone uh, lone wolf terror attacks or you know sleeper cells and all of that. Uh, when we see the elimination of leaders like Sinwar or of Baghdadi or of bin Laden, etc. Uh, are, are, is the number of threats, are the number of threats that may occur, you know, with terror att attacks, do they spike or are they relatively subdued? I mean, that's, um, that's a tough question to answer. And at least going on the historical track record, I think it'd be hard to draw any correlation between the death of a senior leader and an increase in, um, more sort of lone offender terrorism. Yeah, I'm sure there are people who are angry and upset about it, but large majority of those people, even if they're you know sympathetic with those groups and organizations, they're not formal members, they're not being directed or guided. And for the most part, they don't try to do anything beyond, again, being angry, perhaps being radicalized. Um, uh, but, you know, separately, there are probably, you know, people uh, here in the U.S. and, and uh, other parts overseas who are already radicalized and were potentially thinking about doing something uh, because they buy into from these jihadist um, kind of worldviews and ideologies. But it, it, the death of a senior leader, from my experience, isn't the thing that motivates most people to then want to go off and conduct an attack. If, if a group chose to actually organize a retaliatory attack in response, but that's different. That's not lone offender terrorism or lone wolf terrorism. And again, going back to Hezbollah, when uh, the, the person who was the secretary general before Hassan Nasrallah, guy named Abbas Masawi, was killed in um, southern Lebanon by Israel in 1992 in February of that um, year, within roughly three weeks, Israel uh, Hezbollah pulled off a terrorist attack against the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires, Argentina. So other side of the world um, from Lebanon, roughly three weeks after the death of the Secretary General and a terrorist attack that killed 28 people. Uh, and here we are a month after, or almost a month after the death of Hassan Nasrallah and no terrorist attack or plot that we know of from Hezbollah. So that's the type of threat I think that, that a group could sponsor, but the sort of lone, offender kind of one that that generally doesn't you don't generally see a spike in the aftermath of the death of a, of a senior terrorist leader okay that's super interesting especially that example uh of hezbollah from the early 1990s because i mean i wasn't alive then neither or i think many of our listeners so that's a, i think a very interesting thing to note uh, you know javid before we sort of close out i mean hamas is part of this axis of resistance uh you know sort of spearheaded uh, by iran hamas hezbollah the houthis and you know some other organizations so i mean you know we are we saw these exchanges between Israel and Iran, uh, does anything change with that, do you think, with the Israel-Iran sort of situation, the potential for conflict? Does it change the dynamic at all? Well, I mean, a lot of the, the whole axis of resistance is backstopped by Iran, as you mentioned. And just like how Israel has been locked in conflict with Hezbollah and Hamas since the 1980s, the same thing with Iran. But what makes things very different now um, versus previous sort of spikes in, in threat activity or, or conflict with you know, all these different um, sort of uh, kind of players is that Israel is fighting all of them at the same time. Like this has never happened before. Israel has never take, tried to take on 
the axis of resistance or what we would call the axis of resistance now um, at the same time. And if anything, this almost looks like a replay of the 1973 Yom Kippur War versus Jordan and Egypt and Syria. Now, they, those are nation states, not terrorist groups. But um, this is very different for Israel. And so for a year, they've been fighting Hamas. Um, they've opened up a second front now with Hezbollah over the past um, four to six weeks. They are periodically hitting the Houthis in Yemen, which are also part of the axis of resistance. And Prime Minister Netanyahu, asked, even before yesterday, or today's news, has already said that Israel will respond to Iran's ballistic missile attacks from two weeks ago, and that will probably be significant as well, and also affect dynamics in the region. So Israel is engaged in a, a struggle with Iran and the groups in the axis of resistance that it has never really had to deal with before. And how long this goes on and where will it twist and turn, because it always does, um, that will be the thing to to the listeners to, to watch. But it's not ending anytime soon. I think this is probably only like the middle chapter of this story that started on October 7th. Well, I mean... It's not a very optimistic take, as you know. I think many of us all hope that this, you know, carnage ends soon. But Javed, uh, as always, thank you so much for your expertise and your time. Uh, we really appreciate it, uh, and thank you for coming on with such short notice, uh, given that we learned this news uh, just a few hours ago. So thank you. Yeah, Andre, um, always a pleasure to be on with you, and uh, let's definitely do that. Thanks. Mm-hmm.